very important that everybody, the buyer, the seller, the lender, everybody reads the preliminary title report. And in the end, you actually sign something with escrow stating that you have read it and you understand it. Um, what the preliminary title report's gonna cover, it's gonna cover the estate or interest of the property, the owner of the estate or interest of the property, and the legal description of the land itself, as well as it's going to show easements, right-of-ways, taxes, um, money encumbrances, things of that nature. Um, go ahead and turn the page, Jen. So as you can see, you can see a kind of a little outlook of what the preliminary report's gonna look like. If you ever wanna know exactly what it is, read this page to the left. Um, you know, I'll give it, to, you guys can read it at your own time. Um, it's very explicit on what it, the preliminary title report does and what it's trying to accomplish. The preliminary title report itself is not a guarantee and it's not a policy. There's no liability associated with the preliminary title report. It's just a report that we issue prior to the closing of the transaction. Um, this is a great little source of reference, by the way, if you want to keep this. Um, print it out, throw it in your desk, um, your briefcase. That way, you know, hopefully you're using Chicago Title as your title insurer, but even if you're using Brand X, they all read pretty much the same. They may be formatted a little bit differently, but the gist of what they're trying to do is pretty much the same. Um, so as you can see on the page to the right here, um, you're going to have who the title officer is, their information as well as the escrow officer's information, um, their contact information, email address, and so on. Right under that is the says property address. Typically properties are open two different ways. Most common way is with property address or the assessor's parcel number. Um, so when you're reviewing those, look at that property address and make sure it is in fact the same as what you have your contract on and what you've opened the order on. Um, sometimes they will vary a little bit, but it's a good question. If you see a different address than what your contract shows, just ask the escrow officer, call the title officer and have them explain why we're showing something different there. Um, the reason for this is commonly, if you have a property that sits on the corner, let's say it sits on the corner of Shaw and Weldon, for example, um, it may have a Shaw address and it also may have a Weldon address but the county assessor is going to only take one of those addresses to assess the property by. So that might be the address that we find on the county tax roll and that we will actually show on the preliminary title report. Right under that, you have the effective date. Um, typically, the effective date of preliminary title report is going to run about two weeks behind the actual date. And the reason for that is, as all documents are recorded with the county, um, then our company takes those documents, compiles them, and search them on arbitrary accounts, um, which tracks every piece of property in the county. And, you know, we run about two weeks behind for the fact that it takes a little bit of time for the county to get those to us and for us to actually post those to arbitrary accounts. So if you opened up one today, the plant date for today is June 4th. Um, as you can tell, today's the 19th, so that shows you how long of a gap we have. Now, don't let that concern you, though, um, because we will date that down all the way up until the minute it records to catch anything that happens up until the day of recording. Under that, you're gonna have the type of products that's gonna be anticipated to be issued in the transaction. This one has an Alta homeowners policy as well as an Alta loan policy. Um, as we know, most people who buy a home, especially for the first time, they have to get financing through some type of lender. Um, so this is just telling everybody these are the contemplated policies that are gonna be issued once the transaction closes. Under that, it talks about the fee. Now this is, as you can tell, if you look over, um, the fee interest is the absolute ownership of a property. This is the best way that you can hold title. There's other ways of holding an interest in real property, such as a leasehold. Um, this is important because if you believe that you are selling the property from the owner to another party, you wanna make sure that says fee. Because if you get the preliminary title report back and you find that it's a leasehold, they really don't own the property itself. All they own is a lease um, as to maybe the building or the land for farming purposes. We can insure those. Um, we do them all the time and you can convey a leasehold interest. 
but most people that were are most of um most people on this particular zoom meeting are probably going to be asking for the fee title to be insured so uh, make sure that that does say fee or leasehold and if it does say leasehold get a hold of us and let's make sure that we're all on the same page um, right under that let me catch up here um, we this is the vesting this is what we show to be the vested owner of the property um, another good reason for you to be looking at that particular section of that preliminary title report because if you have a contract where Darren Nichols is entered into a contract to sell the property and then all of a sudden you get the preliminary title report and the vesting of the property is somebody else well we may have a problem that's a good time to start asking some questions um, we want to make sure that the people on your contracts are act, the actual seller of the transaction. So please pay attention to that section two, where you have the vesting of the property. There's all sorts of different ways to hold property. This particular one shows as trustee of a trust. Um, you can hold it husband and wife as joint tenants, community property, tenants in common. So it just, what goes there is determined by how they actually acquired the property through the most recent grant deed. Um, so that's a good place to start looking. Now, in this particular case, you see that we have a trustee of a trust. Um, because of that, there's gonna be additional requirements in this report for that trust. We're probably gonna be asked to provide us with a trust certification, maybe even a copy of the trust, showing who the trustees are, um, and so on and so forth. So anything that we have um, requirement wise or any problem we have we will show in this preliminary title report and that's another reason why it's very very important that you actually read them and understand what's going on with them prior to closing um, you know you're not title officers you know your agents and lenders um, but I'm a firm believer if you have a general idea of what you're looking at on a preliminary title report it's going to make you look a lot better in front of your customer Reason is, is you're the front lines. And when your buyer is looking at this preliminary report, they go, well, what is this? And you look at them and go, I don't know. Well, they're gonna form an opinion of you. Um, not that you have to be a title officer, but you can just say, oh, you know, what that is, it's this. Um, or call this, call the title company, because it's very important that they see you as somebody who's proactive in their closing and not just sitting back and, and relaxing and going, well, I don't know. I don't know what that is, just call the title company. So that's why it's a really good idea for you to have this maybe in your desk. So when you get a preliminary report um, and an item pops up, you can pull this out and look at it. Cause if you can tell on the left-hand side, it gives a little uh, synopsis of exactly what those items are and what they're trying to do. So, you know, I'm a firm believer in knowledge is power. And if you have a little bit of knowledge, it goes a long way. Um, Cause as we all know, this is a referral business and you wanna make sure and um, have your best foot forward in front of your clients. Right under that, we have the land referred to in this report is described as follows. Every piece of property has a legal description. This is what we insure. As a title company, we don't insure as to assessor's parcel numbers. We don't insure as to property addresses. And the reason for that is because they can change. Um, the county can change the assessor's parcel number as books get bigger and more and more property is built in areas. Um, a lot of times they expand the books and change the APN numbers. Um, same with the addresses. As we discussed at the very beginning of this, you may have an a property that sits on a corner and it has two physical addresses. Um, as well as the fact that you can go down to the county and ask to change your address of your property and they will go through the process of doing that. So since it can be changed um, without having to record anything, this is the reason we don't insure as to those particular items. But what we do insure is the actual legal description of the property because it cannot change unless you actually do a certificate of um, lot line adjustment um, parcel maps, new track maps, things of that nature, but those all require a recording of the document, changing the legal description, which we can catch a public record. Um, let's go ahead and change the page, Jen. And now we're coming down to the items that are shown in the title report. When it comes to the preliminary title report, please understand that we are showing the items and how they a 
affect the property in order of how they affect the property. Um, as you can tell in this particular one, item number one and two are taxes. Well, why do we do that? Because the county gets their money before anybody else. They get their tax first. If you have a million dollar deed of trust and you don't pay your taxes for $50,000, the tax collector will sell that property for the $50,000 and that million dollar deed of trust would be wiped out. So when you're looking at the preliminary title report, understand that we're showing them in the exact order of how they affect the property, albeit through the recording of the years that have gone by or items that may have been subordinated to other items. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, so items one and two are taxes. Um, item number three is a tax default. As you can see by this, it says that the tax defaulted, it's gonna show the amounts to redeem those. And we typically show about two months in the future um, because it does take a little time for um, files to close. Um, item number five, mellow ruse. Um, you know, we won't get in a long discussion of what mellow ruse are, but anytime you have a mellow ruse or a bond or um, a 1911 act bond, those are gonna be shown um, right under the tax area because again, they get their money first. And then item number six, we're gonna show the CCNRs. Um, this item indicates that there are covenants, conditions and restrictions um, of which owners the property are required to abide by. Well, why is that important? Well, I don't know if any of you guys are out there at homeowners associations, um, but you can not park and say, you can't park your trailer out front. Maybe that's written to the CCNRs. Maybe it talks about what color you can paint your house or the fact that you can't have chickens. You know, that's a big thing now is everybody wants to have chickens in their backyard and, and, and get their own fresh eggs. Well, if you read the CCNRs, there may be some restriction as to saying that you cannot have those. Um, so, you know, you need to read those. Those are provided at no cost. Anytime you want a copy of any document that appears on the preliminary title report, um, just contact us and uh, we can send you copies. In fact, I know that they're gonna be talking about the live look reports a little bit later, which is a great asset because all you have to do is actually click on a box and that document will pull up, but I'll let them discuss that in a little bit. Um, so you know, it's gonna show CCNRs. Um, item seven and eight, if you wanna take a look at the right side of the page, these are easements. Now, why are easements important? Well, let me tell you a little story. Um, let's say you have a first time buyer and it's a husband and wife, a new married couple, young couple, and this is their first home. And if they were anything like my wife, she would be over there three or four times planning out exactly where she's going to put her furniture, exactly where she's going to put her barbecue and her new pool that she's going to build and her spa. And transaction closes, she goes down to the county to get her permit and the county denies it says she can't build a pool. Well, who's the very first person she's gonna call and start yelling at? Well, I'm probably talking to them, it's probably the agent. And then the agent's gonna turn around, they're gonna call escrow. And escrow's gonna say, well, let's talk to title. And then you're gonna to talk to somebody like me, a title officer is gonna say, well, didn't you see item number seven of your report? It's a public utility easement. Um, and that's the reason they won't let you build the pool is because if you try to dig the pool, you're gonna run into a gas line. And so she can no longer have a pool. So it's very important that you actually read the items of the report, uh, make sure you understand them. And if you have questions to, on them prior to closing, let us know so we can discuss them with the, maybe the seller or the buyer and um, make sure that they're aware of what they're getting into on the property. Um, so items seven and eight become very important as easements not only public utilities easements, but if you're out in the country, there may be easements for ingress and egress for your neighbor to traverse your property in order to get to theirs. Um, there may be equestrian easements where they're allowed to ride their horses through certain sections of your property. Um, so there's many different types of easements, uh, power lines, um, cable for television, um, public utilities easements, things of that nature. So make sure you're looking at those, paying attention to them and understanding you know, what the easements are. 
we do have a service that we will actually plot the easements for you, although we are not surveyors and we are not um, engineers, we're, we're title insurers, but you know, we can plot easements if they have a good description. Um, we can attach them to your reports. We typically do those for high life files, big um, ag land files, things of that nature, but we can do them for, you know, basic um, property maybe up in the foothills or up at Shaver Lake or Bass Lake and we can we can do them on those as well. So that is a service we do provide. Um, just talk to your sales rep about that and talk to your escrow officer once you have the order open and done. If you have an easement you want to take a look at see what it looks like on the map, give us a call and we can help you out on that. Um, item number nine, deed of trust. Um, understand that most people who buy property don't have all the cash to purchase it up front. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, it happens all the time. But most people are gonna get some type of um, institutional lender or private beneficiary to loan them the money to purchase the property. So that's what we're showing is item number nine, any money encumbrance. Um, you know, there may be multiple money encumbrances. If you have a first and a second and a third, we're gonna show them in the exact order of how they were recorded because one has priority of the other. Um, a first deed of trust is say for 225,000 recorded in 2018. And then maybe they took out a small second um, in 2020 for another $20,000 with another institutional lender. They're gonna be shown in the exact order of how they affect the property. Because as we spoke about at the beginning of this, um, we're showing all items in the order of how they affect the property when it comes to the final closing and the issuance of policy of title insurance. And again, remember, any item that we're showing on a report is an item that we are not willing to insure against. The only time we take claims is if we miss items, we, we missed an easement, um, we missed a deed of trust, it wasn't shown on your preliminary title report, and therefore was not put onto your final policy of title insurance. This is when title insurance companies take claims and have to pay out money or protect the homeowner from somebody tried to foreclose them or things of that nature on a deed of trust they weren't aware of. Um, Cause I get a lot of times I get a, a call from somebody, Hey, uh, uh, you know, this guy, he, he's got an easement. I want to put on my property. Okay, great. I'll put it on your property. Cause you just asked me to exclude it from your coverage. So, you know, make sure you're reading them, make sure you understand them. Um, item number 10, solar energy system contracts. This is becoming more and more popular, especially in the central San Joaquin Valley. We have an abundancy of sunshine, um, which gets very hot, of course. <laughs> but what that solar energy system is, is telling you that there's a solar contract on that property, that they probably installed equipment on that property, um, solar panels, batteries, things of that nature. If you're doing a sale transaction and you're selling it to another individual who doesn't want that solar, they don't want this, the expense of it or um, they don't want to assume that contract, um, then there's steps that you have to do in order to get that contract removed from the property. Um, once it's affixed to a building, it's considered real property, but in, in essence, it's personal property because if you don't pay your your solar contract or your solar bill with the solar company, they will come remove the solar equipment and may cause damage to the property in the meantime. Um, so if you have any questions with solar, um, you know, speak to your escrow officer, speak to your title officer. Um, there are some endorsements we can issue with those as well. Um, but the majority of the time, most people are gonna buy it, they're gonna assume that solar contract. And if that's the case, then we're going to be required to show that on the prelim as well as the end policy of title insurance. Item number 11 is a solar financing statement. Same thing with an institutional lender. Most of the time when you're buying that solar contract or you're buying that solar equipment, um, you're borrowing money um, to do that. And they typically do that through a UCC financing statement. Um, they're typically good for five years. Um, or the length of the contract, if the contract goes for longer. Um, but it is a money encumbrance, just like a deed of trust. It's just formatted a little bit differently. So, you know, make sure you're looking not only for the deed of trust to be paid off or um, eliminated from your reports if you're the new buyer, but make sure also those solar finance statements are getting paid as well. Okay, Jen. Um, I just uh 
I just got your. Um... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I'll continue on then. So now we're looking at trust vestings, and if you could. Yeah, and that wasn't. I'm sorry. I'm going to jump in. That was Anna trying to connect. I just muted her, so it wasn't oh, Jennifer okay. talking to you. Yeah, she's over there just talking away, isn't she? Yeah, I just muted her because she wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Keep going. That's okay. All right. Um, so now we're talking about trust vestings. Um, remember how this particular property is vested in a trust. Um, sometimes when you have a trust, a husband and wife or anybody as trustee of the trust, and let's say something happens to one of the trustees, maybe they passed away. Um, we have to make sure that we are dealing with the true trustee of that trust or the successor trustee of that trust. And so we do that by requiring certain documents. In this particular case, all we're requiring is a trust certification. Works on the computer. And so on that trust certification, it's going to attest to the fact that they are, in fact, the trustee and they have the authority and right to sign for the trust itself. Um, sometimes what happens, though, if we are unclear as to who the true trustee or successor trustee of the trust is, we may require a copy of the portion of the trust that actually deals with the successor trustee and tells us, who all the successor trustees are and in an order of how they shall serve. Uh, we have to make sure that over a conveying title or that we're allowing somebody to borrow money against the trust, that we have the, the correct trustee actually signing the conveyance documents or the loan documents. Um, so that's what that particular section is. Now, as you go on, you'll see on the right-hand side, you'll see notes. And these are just notes that um, we'll talk about if there's been any conveyance of the property for the past two years. Um, it will sit, we'll talk about who the buyer is um, on the potential transaction. Their name will be inserted there. Um, if we have an SI requirement, a statement information requirement, it's either going to appear in the note section for the buyer or it's going to appear in the body of the report for the seller. Um, so that's a very important thing to be looking at when it comes to notes. It also has what we find the physical address to be. If you're a lender out there and you're a part of this meeting, that's where you're going to find your address for the 116 endorsement. Um, and you can see it right here in note number seven. Um, you can kind of read through that. It says a single family residence known as da -da -da Street in Riverside and that we're going to issue an extended coverage loan policy to them. Um, and also, if there's any problems that we find with maybe the vesting, maybe the proper parties didn't deed out, um, maybe there's a problem with a judgment or lien, you're also going to find those in the preliminary title report as well. Um, they're going to be listed in the body of the report. So let's say we had a problem with a grant deed that was recorded in in 1998 where one party deeded it to the other and it didn't actually convey the property. What we would do on the preliminary title report is we would make the vesting subject to. So we would say we would vest back to the last time that the, the vesting was actually good. Let's say Darren Nichols, husband and wife is joint tenants. And then maybe we found we're just Darren deeded out his interest, but Tanya was never um, dealt with on her interest. So we may say Darren Nichols and Tanya Nichols, husband and wife is joint tenants, subject to item number 13 of this report. And then you would go down and look at item number 13 of the report and it might say the requirement that Tanya Nichols um, deed her interest out or prove if Tanya's deceased or what happened to Tanya. Um, so you're going to, anytime you see a problem, it's going to be in the body of the report. And that's how we deal with it up front to eliminate any type of problems we have when it comes down to the closing date, because we want everything to be ship shaped by the time your documents are ready to record. Um, anybody have any questions so far that they want to relay? I know I'm kind of going through it fast, but, um, they only gave me 40 minutes because they're slave drivers. And so I got to make sure I'm in my allotted time. Okay. Um, if you continue to look at the next page, if you continue to look at notes, you'll see there, um, Jen, you want to turn the page for them? Turn the page, Jen. 
It's a great Bob Seger song, by the way. Um, you see note number 10, um, talks about the SB50s, you know, any type of, of things of that nature will be in there. And then note 11, as we were talking about, is the requirement for a statement of information. Um, what is the statement of information? Well, statement of information is a document that's provided by our company that gives pertinent information about your buyer and seller. Um, and it asks for a lot of information. Who, what's your name? Social security number, date of birth, are you married? Who are you married to? When were you married? Do you have children? What's their names? Um, what do you do for a living for the past 10 years? Um, things of that nature. Have you ever filed bankruptcy? Things of that nature. And why has that become, it's a lot of very personal information and a lot of people balk at the, the requirement for us to get that. But you have to understand that not only do we run um, property for voluntary encumbrances, such as a deed of trust, but we also run them for involuntary encumbrances, such as abstracts of judgment, federal tax liens, state tax liens, child support judgments, unsecured personal property tax liens, things of that nature. Because those also affect the interest of the property. Because the way it works is if you have an abstract of judgment recorded against your name, it affects any and all property that you have. You don't have to describe that property on the judgment. All you got to do is record it against somebody's name. And if they own property, that judgment attaches to that real property. And as we all know, we live in a, a county that has very common names. Um, John Jones. Um, well, what's another good one? Well, let me see. Let me run one real quick here. Let me see. Jose Gonzalez. Perfect example. So on Jose Gonzalez, random this morning, and just in Fresno County alone, we have 3,781 judgments and liens reported against that name. Just that one name. And as a title officer, it's my responsibility to go through every one of those judgments and liens and make a determination if this is the same party that's selling my property or buying my property. And so the only way I'm going to be able to do that is by that statement of information. Because on an abstract of judgment or any other judgment for that matter, you don't always have to put a social security number. All you have to do is record it against Jose Gonzalez. And you have an address of where his last was, you know, when you sued him in court. And now I have to go through there and look at every one of those judgments and liens and make a determination of who my Jose Gonzalez might be. And the only way I'm going to be able to do that is with that statement of information. Because if I have a child support judgment and it says the kid's name was Daniel, and then I get the SI back and it shows all your children and none of them were named Daniel, then I might be able to eliminate that judgment without having to contact the county and go through the process of order and demands to even see if it's my property or, or my party. So that's why that state for, statement of information becomes very, very important. Um, it gives a lot of pertinent information. We know that. Um, but you have to understand that as a title insurer, we are regulated by the state insurance commissioner. And it is very stringent on what we can and can't do with documents. And we don't sell your information. We don't give it away. Um, that information is compiled by our company, loaded into our file. And after a certain amount of time, it is purged or destroyed. Because we don't want that information in our systems any longer than it has to be. Um, so it's very well protected. If you come to my office, um, the doors are locked. And then you'll have to knock on the door. And the only way you can get in is an employee open the door. And then an employee will have to be with you the whole time that you're in my office, walking to somebody's office or going to somebody's desk. Um, you are actually escorted. And the reason for that is because we have so much pertinent information about buyers and sellers, their account visa information, social security numbers, and things of that nature that we don't want anybody just walking through there and be able just to pick up a piece of paper and steal somebody's identity. Um, the same as with your escrow office. When you go into your escrow offices, you'll find that 
the door is probably locked to get into the escrow office. And then they'll have the employee will actually come up and get you, take you to a conference room and actually escort you through the building. Um, so that just shows you some of the rules and regulations that we have to deal with when it comes to personal information. So it's very safe. You know, I understand in today's um, world of identity theft, people really don't want to give out their personal information. But what I do find curious about that is you're asking for a loan, you'll give the lender anything. Oh, you want my first child's name? Here it is. Here's this grade card from high school. Here's this, here's that. Here's my social security number. Here's my income. Here's, you know, you have no problem with that. But if a title insurance company asks you for that, then they start saying, well, I don't want to give that information out. But it's very important that we do receive that information when needed. We won't ask for that information on a report if we don't find anything. But if we have any type of question about if we do have a judgment lien against our seller, um, or even our buyer on commercial transactions, then we're gonna ask for that statement information to be provided and provided to our escrow officer. But rest assured, it's very safe. Um, you know, nothing's gonna happen to us, it's not gonna be leaked out. We don't throw it in the trash can. Um, it's loaded electronically into files. Um, and as you can probably tell by our, because all the money that we have when we wire out all the time, our systems are very secure when it comes to our, um, computer systems and programs. So that's it on the preliminary title report. I just wanted to make sure that you understand it's very important that you read them. Um, make sure your buyers and your sellers are reading them. Um, just have a general idea of what they're doing on the preliminary title report. And again, this information is provided by Chicago sales staff is great information. It's some of that information that just, again, throw in your briefcase, throw in your desk. When you get your next report, you know, look through there, scan through there and compare it to this little, um, provide this thing provided by Chicago Fresno and it will just be a great asset for you um, and your business coming forward. Does anybody have any questions, Jen? I don't see any questions in the chat. If you do have a question that you would like to ask Darren but didn't know quite how to type it, you can take this opportunity to unmute yourself for a second and ask him. All right. I guess you did such a great job, Darren, that everybody feels confident that they can understand their prelim and go from there. Yeah, and again, if you ever have any questions, feel free to give me a call. You know, I'm always here um, for you guys. And anytime you need some assistance, I have no problem with just, you know, talking you through it. Um, I'm a commercial title officer by trade, but, you know, even on residential files, I, you know, feel free to give us a call and we'll always be there to help you. Um, you know, good luck in the future. I hope your business during this crazy time starts to really explode and everybody gets back to somewhat of a normal activity. Um, but make sure you read those reports. Thank you so much, Darren. That concludes that part, but hang in with us. I'm gonna be switching my screen and we're gonna invite Anna Getman to take a walk with you through our live look prelim and explain what that is all about. Anna, are you unmuted? I am now. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here this morning and navigate you through the live look prelim. Um, let's see here. So I so, can ban it for you. Just tell me when to click. Okay, perfect. Um, what we have, what the Live Look Prelim has is a lot, what it basically is, it's an interactive prelim, um, basically offering you the opportunity to view the um, documents that have been of record, recording them um, in regards to that. So whenever you see a blue hyperlink, when we go through this, it's going to take you directly to um, the actual recorded document. So it usually pops up as, as an Adobe document, so you're able to review it. And um, if you have any questions, of course, you should contact our office. Um, 
So if you want to click on to view your new Chicago Title Live book report, um, you can click there. And what you're going to see typically on the left hand side is going to have um, different, uh, that's going to be your summary, the report, uh, linked documents, vesting, legal description. So basically that's what your prelim is just in a stacked order off to the left. Um, and if you scroll down, uh, Jennifer, if you can, yeah, there you go. Um, and then to the right into the bulk, this is basically the exceptions of your of your prelim and what are the exceptions are is what's affecting the property. I'm not gonna go into detail because I'm sure that Darren did a fantastic job um, going over the exceptions and what they are. But in this case, um, if you want to do the drop down menu on number one for property taxes, Jennifer, please. Um, it's going to give you the description as it reads on the prelim. So this is what's going to be on your actual prelim and that's what it's telling you. Um, property taxes that are um, due 2019-2020 and then so on and so forth. So um, if you can go down to the next one, I believe it's, there you go. Um, I'm trying to look to where we can find an actual hyperlink. These basically are gonna be all your taxes, which Darren went over. And if we can, this is just a summary. Okay, um, we're gonna to have to go back to the actual prelim to show them the hyperlink. I thought okay. the hyperlinks were embedded into the summary section, um, but I was in correct for thinking that. So let's go back to the actual um, prelim, but basically you click on this, this is just going to be an electronic version of your preliminary tab report. It's gonna give you all the information as if you were flipping through a, a hard copy of the preliminary tab report. So and, and um, they're color coded, so there's yellow and red and then things that don't have any color so can you share with everybody how that kind of helps them at a glance, kind of know what's going on? Absolutely. Your red's going to be something that you need to pay attention to, um, as well as for the escrow staff, their um, items that we need to address. Um, yellow are just, you know, it's a good idea to know what it is. Um, red actually, should, the deed of trust should be red, so I'm not quite sure why that's not red. It's, or is it red when you click on it? Can you go back up to the deed of uh, trust? It's not. This is a demo prelim, so they may have just okay. not colored it the right color. Okay, so typically those are the items that are red are gonna be items that need to be addressed, that need to be paid you know, within the escrow, that needs to either be paid current, um, any abstract judgments, liens, anything that we can't pass through title onto the buyer. Um, and we have to address them. So um, when you have, the, when you go through them and you see something red and you haven't been asked about it, or you want to make sure that it's being addressed, just reach out to your escrow officer and just say, I noticed that we have some red items on our prelim. Are we good to go? Have they been addressed? Just to kind of cover all bases, you know, closing an escrow is teamwork and involves everybody to be involved. Um, and just to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Okay. All right. Do you want me to navigate to the report or the linked documents? I would like to do the report because um, that's basically what they're going to get from us as escrow. They're going to get the report into their email and they're going to open up the report. And this is how they're going to be able to navigate through the report. Um, and I find it the most, I find it the easiest uh, just because it's something that's familiar. All right, well, can't reach this page. That's, let's see what happens. Okay. Okay, so if you can just scroll down.
I'm waiting to see something okay. blue. We're right. <laughs> if you can stop here, that's fine. Um, so your vesting, if uh, you aren't familiar, or if this doesn't look like what your seller said that they, you know, who you're, who you're dealing with as far as your seller is concerned, um, right now it says XYZ LLC, the Delaware Limited Liability Company, but your seller said that he owns the property and it's John Smith, and you're like, hmm, he never mentioned that he owned the property in, a, in an entity, you know, let me find out. So there's, but if you want to get more detailed, you can present the recorded document to your seller and say, you have, you're, you're J Mr. John Smith used to be on this property, but it's held at XYZ. I've attached a document to support this. Can you just let me know if this is the case? So you click on that, vest it in, and it's going to bring the actual. Well, it would, but today it's not feeling like it. <laughs> <laughs> it would bring up the actual grant deed that was recorded with the county transferring the title to XYZ LLC um, and then this would be very helpful when you do have some discrepancy in regards to who you're um, working with and they didn't happen to mention that they held title in the LLC because this is something that you're going to want to make sure that your contract matches um, who is selling the property and signed the contract. A lot of lenders want to make sure that it's consistent. So if John Smith signed as an individual, as John Smith on the contract, it might become a little bit of an issue or a problem later down the road when the lender is reviewing the contract and said, well, the contract signed, was signed by John Smith. Is he, a signing, uh, he's, is he an authorized signer for XYZ? Um, so this is something that's going to be helpful for you and it's going to be something that you can provide in an email when you are addressing that situation. The second page of the legal, uh, the second page of the prelim is going to be the legal description. Um, if you click on those, I don't know if you need to right now, because this is, um, but if you click on those links, they're going to give you the recorded maps for the, um, Yes, it's just yeah, not playing. Something must have it's happened not playing to, well with you this morning. No, it. There may have been some smart. You want to try the link that they didn't Jennifer? Do that. Huh? You wanted to maybe try the drop down of the link documents. Maybe it'll cooperate. Yeah, let's see in if those way. are just like. Yeah, these are all in PDF. So we'll go to the map. Okay, so this when you yeah, yeah, yeah. so when you click on the hyperlink in the legal description, it's going to render this document for you. Um, this can be useful when you get a lender uh, contacting you stating that the appraisal is um, is addressing the address a certain way, and the title report is addressing the address a certain way. For instance, how it says Brian Street. I'm going to scroll back up just a bit, Jennifer. If it says Bryan Street and the appraisal says Bryan Avenue and there's a little bit of a discrepancy there, you're going to be able to provide this recorded map to the lender and say, and say we, it's known as Bryan Street because that is how the map is recorded. So in this case, the appraisal would be um, amended. Um, there are times where we ha have addressed the address as a different address we would have, for instance a Bryan Avenue and and then we would have to amend the prelim to read Bryan Street so it goes both ways vice versa um, if you want to kind of hop over to the next live document um, to see just to kind of give them a little taste of where that would be I'm going to close this and while you do that, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of go over a few things that I found customers have have shared with me that what was have been helpful in the past is when they don't understand what an exception is because it looks different, it's not very clear, and what and what the description is is stating, and they click clicked on the hyperlink and the document has come up and it there they have been given the opportunity to read through the document and kind of learn a little bit what is you know what the exception is um, because some some exceptions don't just come out and 
bite you, like say, hey, we're the deed of trust and, or hey, we're the taxes. Um, sometimes, for example, the hero and pace loans, they don't say hero and pace. They are described quite differently and ambiguous. Um, and so sometimes people miss that when they're reviewing and escrow's calling them and asking them about the hero and pace and they're a little bit confused because it didn't jump out and bite them saying, hey, I'm hero, hey, I'm pace. So this is very beneficial um, as far as I'm concerned in regards to a hyperlinked prelim because it's, a, it's allowing you to click on those hyperlinks and finding out what exactly are the recordable documents and what kind of situation you're going to be in if, if you haven't been given all of the information that is affecting that property, i.e. solar, um, hero, pace, uh, second mortgages and deeds of trust. Oftentimes, they are not oftentimes, but just recently, and we are coming across the UC financing statement. A lot of people are not familiar with that. Those are used more in the commercial world. Um, they're used quite often, actually, in the commercial world. But um, we are seeing it more and more on residential because solar is being purchased through for what the seller thinks is a private loan through a credit union and the credit unions are not recording a traditional deed of trust um, to secure their interest that they have they have in those solar panels. They're recording these UCC financing statements. So um, if you see that on the prelim and click on that hyperlink, get yourself familiar and just ask those questions. Uh, hey, I see a financing statement and Oftentimes, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I have the conversation, it is a lien and it's on the property. It's just not your traditional, you know, verbiage of an actual lien. Um, so just let's just, just so we can see what things look like, the vesting, the PDF, this is what I was talking about when your seller is not matching your listing agreement and um, you know, you want to be, be have, and, and maybe John Smith did uh, does own XYZ LLC. Um, you're just going to have to maybe do just kind of uh, draw an additional document to go ahead and um, make sure that everything matches. So when you hit, when you click on that link, uh, for example, that uh, vesting, this is what will come up, and this is what you can provide your seller saying this is how you are holding title as an FYI. Um, and this is a very good document just to kind of familiarize, familiarize yourself with because it kind of gives you a little bit of the history of the property, you know, what the seller purchased it for. Because in the past, um, this is another thing that's come up, in the past, some sellers could have the option to not disclose the transfer tax to and it be hidden, but that is not an option any longer. Um, people like would have didn't want to disclose basically how much they purchased the property for, which can be calculated through the transfer tax. But this gives you, you know, some good information. You know, the transfer tax, what it was, you can, the dollar ten per thousand in Fresno County, you can do a backwards calculation and figure out what they had purchased the property for, how they hold title, and the legal description. And if you want to find out who um, handled the transaction previously. Um, this also, in most cases, would give you the title company that recorded the grant deed and, um, and their, you know, their escrow number, i.e., or, and or their title number. Um, do you want to go back to those uh, linked documents, Jennifer? It seems like it's cooperating. Do we want to try to go back to the normal prelim like we were doing that, or do we want I, to? No, because I think what happened, because those were actually tied to SmartView and there was some changes. Uh, I noticed there's a reference to some Google Docs. And just last week, our company uh, shut down access to Google Docs through any system computer. So I imagine okay. that that might be why this is not currently working and we'll have to get it fixed okay. for the next time. That's fine. Um, let's just give them a little quick peek on the taxes. Um, I just kind of maybe want to go over a few things up there and then um, answer any questions after that. Okay, we're just going to download Some things that while, while you do that, I'll just kind of um, point out a few things too that I've seen recently. Um, where this is, was helpful. Um, there will be some times where you'll see 
on the prelim an exception that is uh, referring to a, previ a previous deed um, where in which in the case where maybe Anna Getman deeded her property to Robin, Get uh, Robin Albert, but didn't go through a title company. And so um, you'll see an exception on there for that, um, that effect to the title. And what that's basically is telling us is we need to just confirm that Anna Getman indeed truly meant to deed the property to Robert Albert, you know, outside of title insurance. And then just an affidavit is going to have to be um, executed with the notary. But when you see that, it's helpful. You just click on that hyperlink. It'll give you that transfer deed and, and you could see where that took place. Um, okay, switching back to the title, I mean, to the ta taxes. Uh, this is what we get as our, we have a tax computer and um, this is how we search taxes. You, I'm not sure how MLS works or anything like that. If you have like a tax portal, um, uh, there are, there is a way to search for taxes directly with the Fresno County Tax uh, Collector's Office through their website. It looks a little different than this but this is basically what title, how they receive our taxes. And so the, this is how we know if the first and the second installment is um, paid or not. It lets us know when it was paid, if, if it was paid and or unpaid. Uh, we scroll down. There are times where we're asked that there um, is, how does hero and pays affect the taxes? I just had one earlier this week. The, it happened to be just a refinance, um, but this would be the same as in for a sale if the seller is paying off the here or not if, when, because it's not something that is assumable. Um, when the seller is being paid off, the is paying off the hero or pace, what's going to happen to the tax installment? Because they're looking at a tax installment that is quite high, higher than what the value is of the property. And if there is a hero and pace on the property, it's going to be listed under the special lien description as, as its own line item. In this case, um, there is not one. But the one that I was working with earlier um, this week on a refinance, because they're refinancing to pay it off, um, the bottom line had stated uh, Cal first, you know, something of that sort and then it had $7,500 and that $7,500 is not the balance of the pace it's just what the installment for that year was so if you ha are you in this situation and you want to figure out how much of the tax installment uh, is the hero and or pace um, amount this is where you can click on that hyperlink pull up the taxes and it's going to tell you the hero case of the installment is 5,000 or 2,000. That's um, just keep in mind again, that's not the total to pay it off. It's just what has been allotted for that year in those tax installments. Okay. Um, let's see. Did I go through everything, uh, Jennifer? I think so. Uh, so we'll okay. open it back up. We've just got a minute or two left. Uh, open it up to any questions if someone would like to unmute themselves and ask a question about the live look. All right, such a quiet group today. Well, thank you, Anna, for taking the time to go through this with us. I'm going to stop the screen share so we can see all the smiling faces and appreciate all of you that came on the call today, we did record 99.9% .9 of this today. So we'll be able to send it to you if you feel like you need additional review. And if you wanted to pass it on to somebody else in your office that was unable to attend. So we'll be sending out an email about that once the recording is ready. Did anyone on our team want to add any final words? I, I, I just want to say one other one thing real quick. Um, I, I'm also happy to do one-on-one -on -one, um, 
it doesn't even have to be a live look prelim. If you wanted to go through some uh, a prelims that you have already and are not familiar with those items, I do have a little bit of a title background. So um, I have a little bit more knowledge than your typical escrow officer because I, I did do title for a little while. So I'm happy to do any kind of one-on-one -on -one of any prelims that you currently have that you just don't are not quite understanding what the, those exceptions are and want to just go over them, okay? And Anna, there was a question from uh, one of our attendees that who takes care of the exceptions? Is that you uh, working in conjunction with the title officer? Absolutely. The, it's the responsibility of the escrow officer to review all of those exceptions and make sure that every exception is being addressed. Um, those exceptions, most of the exceptions will be um, passed on to the buyer because they are normal exceptions, i.e. your ta property taxes, any CCNRs, easements, and, and of that sort. But any other um, monetary items, mortgages, liens, um, of that sort that are just uh, that were voluntary, those are the ones that will be addressed and, and the escrow officer should be asking questions to those if they, are, they don't have the information already to rectify those exceptions. And then Kathy Minturn started to speak up and have a question. Kathy, did you still have a thought? I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed this Zoom. It was very well done and so very informative. Uh, thank you so much for the invite. Well, thank you. And we plan on continuing these and we'll keep everyone posted about when the next class is offered. So with that, uh, unless anyone has any other thoughts, we'll conclude this meeting. Okay, thank you so much. Bye thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend.